And so uh, both feedback, um, thoughts, and any missing major items. So Karen and then Eric. Karen. So I think central to the meeting and central to things that every single person on this panel has said is this comprehensive understanding of function, comprehensive understanding of variants, the disease, and therefore I think it's really fair to say it's a foundation of NHGRI and the science that we all work with to have a comprehensive understanding of the genome. Um, therefore we need to prioritize, dare I say with great urgency, the construction of a complete telomere to telomere human reference genome. And I want to emphasize this is not topping up the genome. This will present a fundamental and transformative shift in the way we view human genetics and genomics. And it's timely because of all the projects you're presenting are moving forward at such a speed. If we don't catch up now, we're going to lose all of these interesting fundamental questions in the dust, and it's really hard to backlog. Mm -hmm. And so I want to go ahead and say we know the gene lists are incomplete. We know there are hundreds of genes that are missing. If Evan Eichler were sitting here, he would tell you that this is the most dynamic, highly variable regions in our genome. We know that. We know based on numerous studies based out of labs that have been studying zinc finger proteins, looking at how they have a role in development, transposable elements, which I hope some of the colleagues in the room speak up on, are involved in gene function. Evan's group has been leading the charge on showing how they're important for human evolution and neurodegeneration. And Megan Dennis is even doing even more compelling arguments in looking at model organisms. This is something we're moving into, and NHGRI needs to be behind it. And I think the reason you're hearing a lot of passion in my voice, hopefully, is because I know things possibly that people in this room don't know and how far we already are with technology. This is not something that we are going to reach in 10 years and then we can talk about it. This is something we are standing on today. Before the forefront in 2020, we'll have a complete telomere to telomere human assembly. This is benefiting from the current status of long read sequencing where we can reach a megabase. This is benefiting from the current status of long read sequencing where we have high quality long reads for the first time. This is not an effort by a junior investigator, Karen Mega, talking to you. This is everybody in the field. This is the VGP project pushing forward. This is Evan Eichler's group with his expertise in repeat biology moving forward. These are the reference genomes from Washington St. Louis with Ira Hall pushing forward. This is a huge motion that I think people need to be aware of that this is now. And so I don't want to scream into the wind. I want to actually give two broad initiatives to act on um, that kind of dovetail into everything we've talked about in this morning's session. Um, the first one is really a solid and bold initiative to phase telomere to telomere assemblies of the human genome. The first phase needs to be that we have to invest in reaching the milestone of a one genome project, a complete telomere to telomere assembly of a human genome. And this can be a haploid or an effectively haploid genome. It doesn't matter. We need to have that catalog presented front and center. Phase two is absolutely something we've talked about in breakout session two. We need to use this to develop methods and tools to both increase and deliver on this idea of sequence variants, um, moving into new validation methods and starting to actually study variation. And phase three needs to be moving in towards diploid genomes. And this is where we hit our 10-year vision of where we need to be. We need to be at production level, telomere to telomere assemblies of human genomes. And now my second initiative is more in line with uh, the things that were introduced at the beginning, and that's how do you use that to study function? And so I would argue much in line with what was said by Joe Ecker, that there is no epigenome without a complete genome, in the sense that we need to focus on a reference cell line, perhaps like the HEP1, that I know had gained a lot of enthusiasm from breakout session four, and maybe push on technology to get one of these reference genomes, maybe in one of the tier one encode, complete. Therefore, we can go back to our original data sets. We can develop new tools that utilize benchmark standards and, and controls to make sure we move in the right direction to start to incorporate these regions. Um, and then, and finally, of course, scaling up at that point will be a, a goal of the 10-year plan. Can, can I ask as a follow-up, just to make sure I, I got the notes correctly? Mm -hmm. So one phase is get yourself a beautifully assembled complete genome that you feel every base is in its place. For a genome, yes. For a genome. The second phase is to functionally characterize the elements there and ideally in a pre-chosen cell line for which you would also make uh, an end-to-end Genome? One could easily imagine that same genome could be the same. Okay. For so, example. So but my question. Yeah. So my question is the following: You proposed it as a staged process, mm -hmm. but I would venture to say that there are hard to sequence elements that we do know exist already, and so you could set up functional characterizations even before you have everything. 
that has served this community really well to kind of both do the long term and in parallel do with whatever you can do for the same hard to sequence element repetitive ones and so on. I'm just trying to understand yeah. whether you cannot proceed with part two before you completely finished part one or whether you can actually do both. I don't want to steal the, the platform. I think there are other colleagues in the room who will have information to contribute to that answer. But for me, I view the genome from the centromere. And what I work with are millions of bases of tandem repeats that are embedded with transposable elements, mm -hmm. have paralogous genes, are embedded with segmental duplications, are involved in human disease, and everyone's maps are missing them, and no one's got models to work from. And I think that when you're working in transposable biology and you work just with a reference genome, you're missing these unreferenced oh, sequences, things like that. And so I think this incomplete list um, I, I don't my, think yeah. you got my question. Okay. My question was, as you progress in the effort to fill in all mm -hmm. the blanks, information will start arising. Yes. Would you wait until you had everything before you turn to phase two? That's the way you presented it? I or think. would you then kind of charge into phase two while finishing up phase one? Well, I think that's up for discussion. Okay. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not hardline. I'm pushing for a community discussion on that. But right. at the same time, I definitely feel there's an advantage with today's technology cool. that we can reach that goal. I don't think it's something that's outside the scope. Great. Thanks. Eric, next. Um, I would say I agree with uh, Karen 99%. Uh, <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, the question in, is which, in, in, which in, is in, that in, remaining percent? <laughs> yes. Right. Is that, I mean, I'm in having that, issues I, with in that actually, I don't think the drum is being beaten loud enough here at this meeting about the need and the mm -hmm. requirement for end to end chromosomes. Mm -hmm. I think. Uh, I think my answer to your question about should it be done in parallel, I think yes for these different phases, but I think the amount of weight and funds and money and effort and a technology, you know, um, effort should go into, should, more should be put in getting that end-to-end -end chromosome and not just of one individual. And I think we should start with the, I mean, I think we can go both diploid and haploid, but I think uh, just solving it for a haploid is not going to automatically translate to a diploid. So. <clears throat> So those are my answers to those questions. I just wanted to second everything else that was said. The, uh, but I had a, a technical question to Marilyn. You, you put up in your slide a mechanistic versus causal uh, uh, studies. And so I, w I don't see the difference between those two terms. And I'm wondering, what did you mean by that? Maybe correlation versus mechanistic or causal, but not those two. Um, I guess. Mechanistic is thinking about trying to understand the how the various components work together. The predictive or causal, I guess, is more of the, maybe correlation would have been a better word than causal, but predictive, the does this genotype explain okay. or predict this phenotype without understanding the how. Okay. This, this came in the, this was a result of a discussion uh, uh, led by Jonathan Pritchard in the, in the computational breakout yesterday, breakout six where Jonathan emphasized that you could get a great um, gen uh, genotype to phenotype prediction without knowing the mechanism. You don't know the mechanism, and that's a downside, but it's an area that merits its own advances, as the polygenic risk score really amply demonstrated. We have no idea about the mechanism there, but it's still predictive, and the predictions are still helpful, and there's work to be done there that it can, again, kind of proceed in parallel while the mechanism, and ideally both, combine at the end. All right, um, thanks. But I, I think what Karen brought up is even more important, though. It's, as you can see, that's the only thing so far that appears on the extra slide. We have Eric and then Ro Robert and then somebody in the back. I saw another hand. Great. I, I just have a brief suggestion on Karen's point and then wanted to raise a completely different point. Um, I think it would be enormously helpful for somebody passionate about the subject, maybe you, to actually lay out what's stopping us from having one end-to-end -end genome. Is it an R01? Is it a million dollar project? Is this going to be a $20 million project? I think what's, what's unclear perhaps to people who aren't as close to it is what's the barrier and what's needed to overcome it? And then once you've got one of them, many human genetic analyses like might require 10 of them or 1,000 or 100,000 of them. It'd be interesting to ask, you know, do you have ways having had one of them to do more cheaply? Do you, how many do you think you're gonna need? So I think in, in some sense, those of us who don't spend our days thinking about telomere to telomere would love to see some simple write-up of 
of that progression. I'm not asking you to lay it out now, but it sounds like if you were to write that, I think you'd get many more people on board if it was concrete about what those steps were, what they caused, and what the barriers were. So that was my, my suggestion. I think NHGR would find that enormously helpful. It's clear that you know, many people believe in the importance of it. Now reduce it to a plan. My, my point was a, was a different question, which had to do with this, this um, very important point about the data that was going to be residing in other locations, particularly in companies and hospitals. And I very strongly agree with the idea that patients in principle can you know, have the right to move their data under HIPAA. They typically, I mean, they, they do have the right to move their data. And, you know, we're involved in some such projects, but I think NHGRI could do something unique. Not only does the patient have the right to move her data, the patient has the right to designate an agent to do so. I think the idea of getting every person in the United States to sign up to port their data, that is, wrangle the company to move their data, to give them their data, which will show up on a CD or something like that, and then upload it, um, is less likely to happen. However, if there were a designated agent to which the patient could simply consent and say, I wish my agent to do it, then it becomes trivial. And HGRI might serve as such an agent if they felt uncomfortable doing it given their government status. And you know, FNIH might do that. But I think making it a one-click decision to do it and also have a right to remove it would build on your idea to make it truly transformative. And I think we ought to really call for NHGRI to ensure there is a plan to do it, either by itself or by some clear party or parties that, that could manage that process. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. um, yes, Mike. Sorry, just in response to that, do you need that to be identified by the patient, or would you be good with them being able to give de-identified data? Because I think for the people who are already signed up in one of the PCORI projects, there's already a mechanism to do that, but it could be made less tedious. Yeah, so I, I think the details of identified, not identified, what kind of data might be allowed or not, it's possible that if there were an agent or agents that you could just do, there could be a, just a small menu of what you're willing to consent to. Uh, so I think it's really developing a, a basic regime for managing the sharing and privacy that makes it simple. Um, and I don't think we have to decide one or the other, but you're raising really good points about the fact that 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 regime would, would have a few buttons or some you know privacy policies it might attach to it. I, I know Sharon wants to comment on that as well. I'll try and keep time for this, but we want to see as many additional things, so right. extremely brief. My point is I think that's really a genomic medicine issue that is being heavily addressed in other settings, and ClinVar is an example of that. Yeah. There are very large labs submitting hundreds of thousands of variants a year. So I think we have already some ways to do that that just need to now be increased to the point of raw data. And it's a, and it's a platform question, just to remind people here. This is a computational platform question of how to integrate with a process. So I think it remains as a point, but it's parts of its implementation are inside the platform part or outside. Richard. Thank you. Um, one one uh, area that has not been discussed at all at this meeting is nuclear biology, and I've been looking for somewhere to put it. And I wonder, in your beautiful diagram, going from uh, variants all the way to whole organisms, if you would like to put in something subcellular between molecules and cells. Excellent. And that we can consider in there some of the perturbations of normal nuclear function as we decode the genome. And why not include other organelles? Yeah. Uh, so I, I say, instead of saying nuclear biology, we would say subcellular. And one of the items that did come up, it was hard, I think, to see it in all these slides and brief presentations we made, is that in general, the connection between molecular and genomics 
and cell biology. It's not just well-defined organelles, it's also these com you know, membrane-less compartments that are very exciting. This is a great opportunity, and from the discussions yesterday, it was apparent, especially in the breakouts, that combining molecular and image information about cells would make that connectivity, but it's not written as such, and we would add that. If I can just call out, there, there is the 4D nuclear program, yep. which owns a lot of this, but I think there's definitely a gap, and it would yeah. be a shame if we didn't uh, point to that. Other questions? Oh. Uh, uh, there was someone there earlier, but they... Sarah Tish, I'll be. There are That's three it. Over here. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so Trey Eidecker, UCSD. So, so actually, it's the a good time. The lights are really unfortunate. No, that's okay. So, so to follow on Richard's point, I'm going to try to make a fine point of, of that, and I'm going to do it from a different angle, which is three reasons why genetic perturbation followed by omics profiling I think is a good idea, but is, is fundamentally going to disappoint, okay? And I'm going to go through it. And we've covered almost all these at the meeting, but I don't think it's been summarized and, and, and you know, enough. Okay? So again, this core idea that, that we're going to perturb individual genetic elements and measure a stack of profiles in response has pervaded the meeting. It's a great idea. The technology is, is, is moving by leaps and bounds. But now let's talk about some of the problems. Okay, so one, the effect of the perturbation isn't seen in the profile or profiles you look at. So you could propose to look at yet more layers with the hopes of finding something in those additional layers. But as often, you're going to find those additional layers have redundant information. And you've just spent a lot of money to get that redundant information. Two, we've talked a lot about combinatorial perturbations and how those uh, fundamentally can't be covered adequately and certainly in any kind of systematic way. Um, and so because you can't do more than single perturbations exhaustively, then any epistasis will mask the effects you see or, or important epistasis, for instance, uh, for drug ability later may not be revealed. Okay, and then, and then finally, we've talked a lot about pleiotropy and, and what I'll call indirect distal effects. So a lot of the times when you perturb an element and you measure a profile in response, you find that the, the signal to noise ratio is rather low, meaning, and, and, and Aviv, you summarize this in, in, in sort of your, your flow chart, you get lots of these pleiotropic or downstream effects where the few causal direct effects upstream you're looking for are, are really hard to find. Um, and so, so these are problems, and there may be more, but I think the key, or at least one key to sorting this out is just what Richard said. It's structure, structure, structure superimposing these perturbation and profiles with, with knowledge of this physical architecture, whether it's of, the, of chromatin in the nucleus or, or structures of proteins in the cytoplasm or, or groups of cells and tissues, that uh, I think is going to be invaluable for, for integrating with those perturbation information. So I'll, I'll get off my... my uh, you know, so box. Uh, bully, yeah, pull yeah. and, and I'll, I'll, I'll say two. I'll say two points in response. It was actually in the com in the in the summarized suggestion. It does say to do molecular and structural information, image information, and so on, so, which so is I where the two connect. You, the second, no? I would just beef up the structure, yeah. and, and I would move all the protein, and so 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 a lot of that was in profiling, and I think it should be in structure. Mm -hmm. We need to beef up the structure. It's there. In any case, <laughs> the second item I would make is the fact you can't do something exhaustively does not mean you cannot do it systematically. I don't want to belabor it, but I think it's an important distinction. You can get to a systematic understanding of something even if you don't go through all the cells in the world. We'll move on. I have a quick point. I completely agree with what Trey said. We have unlimited number of perturbations and uh, uh, phenotyping, mm -hmm. phenotyping assays. There's just not enough money to do all of them uh, intelligently. So I think the better and um, cost-effective way is to start with the structure, meaning the knowledge structure, the theoretical frameworks that guide us of detecting, I mean, testing hypothesis, detecting uh, a design experiment based on that hypothesis, and also explore the uncharted territories. We can smartly design those perturbations to assess knowledge gaps in our current uh, structure, uh, understanding of the cellular networks. Uh, so that would be 
my suggestion. So the structure here is not literally structure, but the knowledge structure that we have to put in place in guiding perturbations and uh, observations. Just a second, since I'm typing, Barbara. Uh, as a practical matter, returning briefly to the telomere to telomere genome or first few genomes, if we're serious, the first one should be non-European and so on and so on uh, as we go through those telomere to telomere perfect genomes. Okay. Um, Andrea and then Jeff. So I wanted to comment just on Carol two prior remarks because I think one of the disappointing aspects of perturbational profiles has been that they have been done when the cells have actually reached equilibrium. So you, you let them relax and, and homeostasis in the cell buffers out 90% of this per, of single gene perturbation. So I think one really important point of perturbation, they have to be done dynamically. So you have to follow the trajectory starting at very short time points. And so the development actually of, of you know, slam seek type technologies to actually be able to do really short time is going to be absolutely critical to understand the role of perturbations. Otherwise, it's just, you just lose it, the cell just completely compensates. And Jeff. Uh, I, I also uh, wanted to echo uh, what Karen said, and specifically, I wanted to bring up that uh, that kind of telomere to telomere data would facilitate a proposal made uh, by Emma on the first day, which is uh, in her vision talk, she envisioned uh, the first synthetic human chromosome in building the yeast genome, and we could never have done it without that telomere to telomere information. So I think if long DNA synthesis technology is indeed a priority, uh, I can't imagine a better, you know, uh, outcome than a synthetic uh, mammalian chromosome. So I think these two uh, efforts could really dovetail well. Uh, over that side. Yes. That's the person yeah. I was looking for. And Sarah. <laughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. Me? The, Sarah. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Sarah Tishkoff. Hi, Sarah. Yeah, what I was going to say a lot earlier was just saying I really agree with this, you know, end-to-end uh, reference genome, yep. and as another person commented, don't make the first one a European. In fact, yep. I would argue for African because <laughs> they have most of the variation. And the fact is that, you know, the, but it's not enough, even not just an African, <laughs> because there's so much diversity in Africa and other places in the world. You literally are going to have parts of the genome missing or additions or, <laughs> I mean, you're just not going to see it unless you do a panel. So while I strongly support that, I would strongly support doing an ethnically diverse panel. Yeah. Written. Carol. Carol. Hi, so Andy. Andy will come after Carol. Oh. Carol. Thank, thank you. The, anyone oh. who's in that line is at a disadvantage because the lights are blinding me. <laughs> <laughs> Carol. Carol Paul, Jackson Lab. Um, two quick comments. One is on model organisms. So we've had a lot of discussion about model organisms for validating patterns perhaps that are seen computationally. I just want to make sure we don't lose uh, a couple of the points that have been made over the past couple of days. So uh, Emma had made the point about, well, let, maybe we need to move beyond the six major model organisms that we have been using. Um, but we also need to innovate the existing model organisms to be able to actually model and validate some of the complex things we're talking about. So if, if we were, for example, able to uh, sequence an end-to-end -end synthetic mammalian chromosome and we wanted to put it in a model organism to evaluate behavior, we don't have the technology yet to build such a model uh, that's reliable, robust, and useful. And so it, it's, it's not building disease-specific models, like is the responsibility for maybe other ICs. It's actually building models as tools to enable genome biology generally, so generic sort of models. And I think we need to, to think carefully about what is needed to do some of the validation of the uh, really cool data generation projects we're talking about. That's one thing. My second comment um, sort of builds on this um, idea of the we no longer, the data are out there, right? So individuals who are not trained as scientists are going to have their own genomes, um, and Eric's point about looking for agents that can help them manage and understand that is, is very true. So I think one of the things we haven't talked about, which may be discussed later, is genome literacy. Um, so we not only have to train the next generation of scientists, we need to make sure we're paying attention 
to the lay community and helping them to understand this technology, what a genome means, what it can and cannot do. Uh, and I think that whether or not that's purely the responsibility of NHGRI, I don't know, but I think it's something that as a community we need to address, and it might be part of the strategic plan. And with the PRS, one would claim it's coming sooner rather than later, as in like right now, right? But I see Sharon nodding already. I, I wanted to comment on the model organisms. That, that reminded me something we did not put in but was mentioned, which is genetic diversity in the model organisms and high-resolution kind of physiological phenotyping of the model organisms, <coughs> both of which are things that are easier to do sometimes with model organisms than with humans. So I'll put this in. Okay, now? Andy, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I can pull together model organisms and Karen's project. And, okay, um, then and I also, can't put it in uh, my bullet points think, that way. And thinking about the issue of uh, Francis Collins defending that project before Congress has me um, concerned. And so the most common cause of spontaneous abortion is non-disjunction. The most common birth defect at birth is Down syndrome. And we have appalling lack of understanding of, you know, what is the reason for differences and failures of the centromere? And so this end-to-end -end project will get sequenced through the centromere, and getting sequenced through the centromere is the first step to understanding function. Now we know that the centromere is defined by a variant of histone 3 called CENPA in humans. It has other names in other species. It's involved in actually the recruitment of microtubules to form that kinetochore that determines the disjunction of the chromosomes. The, added aspect to the project that Karen mentioned is we do need to think about variation in these regions of the genome. Different centromeres do have different abilities to assemble this uh, kinetochore, and they have different meiotic and mitotic properties as well. In Drosophila, we have been successful at assembling, not telomere to telomere so much, but we do have through the complete centromere of a couple of different species now. And um, we've been looking at actually doing experiments where you can set up heterozygotes with very different structures of those repeats in those regions, and they do confer different mitotic and meiotic properties. So there's a compelling medical reason for this uh, end to end sequence. Um, so now I know where I'm moving it. <laughs> and, and then I really like Trey's comments about uh, failure modes. And I think the failure mode that we need to be most uh, concerned about is one that uh, Laura Byroot brought up. Um, the cost of diabetes is currently estimated at $327 billion per year, roughly 10 times the budget of the whole NIH. And that'll probably double in the next 10 years. <clears throat> this is a disorder that's caused by our behavior with our forks and knives, largely. And so the idea that we're gonna be able to um, design mechanistic models where we think of all the variables that go into them and fit these models and we're, we're good is perhaps a little bit naive that there are other aspects of biology that come in that we wouldn't have predicted. So behavior is going to be a really important one for these complex traits. And this is, brings me to the final point, which is, okay, we want these models to all be mechanism and sort of driven by understanding the biology. But what about if the guys with the machine learning models, the black boxes, beat the pants off of any model that you can come up with? This seems very likely to me, and it's not quite clear. Like, what do you do then if you have a much, much better predictor that's, that's a black box? So, so and it'll be able to accommodate all this behavior stuff that we wouldn't have thought of otherwise. So, so this is precisely why we actually made the distinction between the mechanistic and the predictive models, and we said we should be doing both, rather than trying to say we should be doing one over the other. In an ideal world, everything would merge. In reality, you will have progress on both of them, and at some point, interesting things would happen, such as these predictive machine learning algorithms would become less and less black boxes over time, or they will find ways of using the molecular information as features, even if it doesn't actually lay out an explanation in the terms of the central dogma. That was kind of Jonathan Pritchard's point. I think it's a really good point, which is why we wrote it in this way. At least so, I think a, we need to, yeah, so we, we I, need to I, cut. Katie has to make a comment, because she's been Patiently no, waiting right. under um, the under these flashlights, right. and Katie. Then, uh, if there's any just completely new idea that we're missing, I think there is one from there, and Katie first. Okay, I'll be brief. Um, I thought that this session really highlighted nicely the um, complexity of the computational aspect of this work. Two examples were 
um, transfer learning, which is easy to say and, and hard to do. Um, and uh, the other one was um, looking at the tails of the PRS score, which sounds like a good idea, but that is using the genetic data to set up your model. It is therefore, you can't just run a QTL analysis because the genetic variants were used in the selection. It's now a conditional inference, which is a completely mm -hmm. different type of statistics than working with data that's just random sample from a population. So just those two examples and what Andy just said as well, um, highlight that we you know, need to continue the commitment that NHGRI has already had to co supporting computational science, and I would say double down on it. Mm -hmm. And last. Hi, I'm Megan Dennis, UC Davis. So um, just, uh, just jumping on, I have two things. So jumping on what Karen said, also not forgetting to sequence trios to be able to understand the mutational mechanisms of these, of these complex variants. And something that I didn't see at all in this presentation was comparative genomics, sequencing other species, and being able to, being able to use those sequences to annotate. So that's really important. I'd like to see it up there. Yeah, it was actually kind of half hidden inside these transfer things but it wasn't written as a separate one, it was just across multiple species, which is a little, a little different. We didn't hear actually something concrete around what precisely needs to be done for comparative genomics. It was mentioned multiple times that something should be done, but it wasn't very specific. So if there is one, despite Elise looking at me, I think somebody should say what it is, and maybe it's Eric. Yes, well, as, as some of you know, that I'm, I'm a chair of a group now called the Vertebrate Genomes Project, and, uh, and the goal of that project is to generate at least one high-quality reference genome, if possible, telomere or telomere, of all 66,000 vertebrate species. Now, we don't have the funds or the budget or the means to do all of that, so in our phase one, we are we're doing crowdfunding among scientists to generate uh, one high-quality reference genome for a species representing all vertebrate orders with a 50 million year divergence relationship in the tree, um, even including humans. And so this would add up to 260 species that we're trying to have completed sometime between this year and next year. So that's actually what's being done, and we're phasing them as much as possible. Um, I think that that resource, and if we can use some more help, hint, uh, <laughs> is that um, <clears throat> I think that resource alone will be quite valuable for annotating a new human genome uh, and uh, you know, inferring a, a gene evolution and structure and so forth within humans uh, from at least uh, things that have happened in the last 50 million years. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for a vibrant session. And um, uh, thank you to the, our three panelists for all of the work on synthesizing uh, these proposals. <laughs>